There we go. Okay, we're on the air. Uh, today I want to discuss the um, exam. So the midterm exam will be Thursday, and uh, what I want to do today is go over the uh, corresponding exam for the last semester, which you were supposed to download from the website. And I've already discussed it somewhat, but I'll start again from the beginning. So uh, at the beginning, very top, it says, uh, <clears throat> I pledge my honor that I have neither uh, given nor received aid on this exam. So that means don't cheat. Don't cheat. If you don't know an answer, just leave it out. Um, then it says, show all work, attach work pages. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to uh, bring scratch paper with you. And um, uh, there'll be a table, just like the last exam, where you're supposed to write your answer. But all the answers should be supported by some kind of calculation or explanation or something. Just an answer written in by itself isn't worth anything. And that should be on the attached worksheets. And on those things it says, um, calculate all complicated ratios to six significant figures. That means if there's something with um, fancy combinatorics on it, uh, and you have to work it out as a, uh, as a decimal, write it out to six significant figures because, for example, suppose the answer is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 7. Well, if you write it out to only uh, six significant figures, or five, uh, all you get is zero. So I can't tell one answer from another. So, um, excuse me, I don't mean five. I mean, if all you do is write the leading digits, if you don't get rid of all the zeros, then there's no information in the answer. However, in your case, that's not going to matter because there aren't going to be any questions that are, uh, that are going to require that. But that's what was said in this one. Write on one side of page only. That's important because, remember, I have to grade these things. There's about 70 of them or so. You want me to be in a good mood when I'm grading yours. So what you should do is make sure that on the scratch paper, everything is written as neatly as possible and the answers are clear for which draw a line, for example, when you separate one problem from another. So that uh, it's easy for me to simply look at the answer on the front, see whether it's right or wrong. And if it's right, I just quickly flip and see whether or not you have something that supports it that makes sense. And if so, it's right. If it's wrong, then the amount of partial credit you get depends on what's written down on the, uh, uh, on the worksheet. And if I can't read it or if it's upside down, Lots of people do that for some reason. At the end, they just throw everything together in a big mass. So make sure everything is in order. And one side only, because remember, these are going to be stapled. I don't have to pick them up and do this kind of thing. So if I can't see it when I turn the page, as far as I'm concerned, it's not there. So just remember that. Write neatly, write on one side of the page. And make sure that you can, uh, I can see clearly which final answer, which argument applies to which problem. Uh, then it says, write answers in space provided. In other words, you have to write in the, uh, the answer on the cover sheet. Uh, finally, staple in upper left-hand corner. Um, so I'll bring a stapler to class. So what you should do is, uh, when you're finished, bring the exam up with everything just ready for me to staple. And um, don't uh, take the edges and turn them over and rip them and stuff like that like people sometimes do, because it's a big mess then when you get a pile of it. OK, so that's about it as far as the rules go. So here's the question. It says, consider two identical looking coins. C1 is a fair coin and C2 is biased, such that the probability of H, that's head, on any toss is 3 quarters. And of course, then the probability of kale would be 1 quarter. So question one says, suppose that C1 and C2 are tossed together, find the probability that they match. That is, that you get head, head, or tail, tail. So first of all, let me call the answers P1, P2, and so on. This is P1. And part of the reason for doing that is that, in some cases, um, the answer to one question will depend on the answer to a previous question. And uh, if, it's, if you miss, for example, let's suppose that P2 happens to be 2 times P1. So if you, uh, if you missed P1, and I can't tell that you actually multiplied P1 by 2, then you would miss both problems. But if you miss P1, 
and the answer to P2 is clearly 2 times P1, especially if it says on your worksheet 2 times P1, then you get full credit for the second one. So, you, so if you make a mistake at the beginning, you don't want to lose more credit for it than the one time that you made the mistake. So keep that in mind. Okay, so P1 is the answer to the first one. And it says, suppose they are tossed together, find the probability uh, that they match. So uh, first of all, you have to make an assumption here. The assumption, obvious assumption, is that the coins are independent of each other. And you could make some other assumption. Um, most people don't even think about it. They automatically assume that. But you could, after the test, claim that I didn't give you enough information, and therefore, uh, your wrong answer shouldn't be counted wrong. But that's phony. I mean, if, if what you should say is, if there's information that you need, and you don't have it, you should say something like, let's assume the coins are independent. Nobody ever does that. So anybody who would come up with that answer, with that excuse later, is a uh, wise guy, I guess. But just let me say it. So you're making an assumption here. The only reasonable assumption the coins are independent. And then if they are, what's the probability of H, H, or T, T? Well, one of the coins is uh, fair. Its probability of a head on any toss is one half. And the other coin is biased. Its probability of head on any toss is three quarters. If they're independent, then the probability of head on the fair coin, head on the biased coin, would be the product of the marginal probabilities. That's one way I can get both uh, coins the same. The other is I can get tail, tail. The probability of tail on the fair coin is a half. The probability of tail on the biased coin is a quarter. And so the answer is whatever that gives you. Of course, you can immediately see that you can factor out the one half. And then what's left is three quarters plus one quarter. And three quarters plus one quarter, of course, adds up to one. So the answer is one half. And from this, you should recognize that from the viewpoint of the biased coin, it doesn't make any difference what the probabilities are, because if you call that one P and that one Q, they have to add up to one. And so as long as one of the coins is fair, the answer will always be one half, regardless of what the values of the probabilities are for the biased coin. So once you see the one half, you should say, why is that? And then the answer is, well, uh, since the uh, uh, fair coin has probability of one half of being either head or tail, then no matter what the bias coin is, the probability that the fair coin will be the same thing will be one half. So you could have written down the answer immediately without any arithmetic. I think I discussed this last time, is that right? Did I get the same answer? Okay, that was P1. P2. Suppose that coin C2 is tossed three times. Find the probability that it produces at least two heads. Well, actually, this is a special case of a, of a more general problem. I'll write it over here. Suppose that I toss the coin n times. And uh, let the probability of head be p and the probability of tail be q. So probability head equals little p, and probability of tail equals little q. And of course, p plus q have to add up to 1. And then, suppose I ask for the probability that there are exactly k heads. So I would say this. Well, I'm going to have a string of uh, h's and t's, like that. If there are to be exactly k heads, then any such string, if the tosses are independent, will have probability p raised to the k power and q raised to the n minus k. So here's a string of exactly k uh, h's and n minus k q's. So the probability of the string is the product of the probabilities of the individual tosses. And uh, uh, when I multiply that out, they're going to be exactly uh, kh's. So that's going to be p multiplied by itself k times, and q multiplied by itself n minus k times. But you have to add those up over all possible combinations of those things, all the different ways that you can uh, 
permutative, which is n choose k. So this would be the probability of exactly k heads. But it says at least. So what I would want to do is I would want to sum this from k equals something, in our case, at least uh, two heads to n. So this is the general rule. But in this particular case, this is simple enough. Because in our case, n is equal to 3, uh, <coughs> equal to 2. So we'd have this. So the probability of uh, uh, getting, um, let's see, it says here, uh, at least two heads. So the probability of exactly two heads would be equal to 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter to the 1 in any particular order. And the number of different ways I can permute the two h's and the 1t is 3 choose 2, or 3. So that's the number of uh, ways, or this is the probability that when I toss the coin three times, I will get two heads and one tail. And now I have to add that to that, the probability that I get um, three heads and no tails. So that would be three quarters to the three times one quarter to the zero. Of course, that doesn't make any difference. And then that would be multiplied by the number of ways that can happen, which would be equal to three choose three or one. Of course, if you just wrote 3 times 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter plus uh, 3 quarters cubed without the other stuff, you get exactly the same answer. So it's not necessary to write it out like this, but it's worthwhile, at least now, pointing it out that that's a, a uh, special case of this form right here. And if you do this work, this will turn out to be equal to uh, 27 over 32 which is the same thing as 0 0.84375. Okay, any questions about that? Pretty simple. Question number three. <clears throat> One of the coins is selected at random and tossed twice. If it produced HH, find the probability that it was coin two. So it says here that you selected it at random and you tossed it twice, but you don't know which coin it was. But the fact that it produced two H's means that it's more likely to be the biased coin than it is to be the fair coin, because the biased coin produces H's three quarters of the time and the fair coin produces H's half the time. So this is a uh, 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 conditional probability. So what I want to know is this. What's the probability that the coin is C2 given that I got HH? So I'll just use the, uh, the fact that it's actually a Bayes rule problem because we know that uh, the coin was either C1 or C2. We observe something and then we try and determine which of the events in the partition. Remember, it's a partition of the sample space that the coin that selected was either coin one or coin two. Okay, so I'll then use Bayes' rule, which says that what I want to do is I want to turn these things around. So I'll write the numerator as the probability of heads, heads, given C2 times the probability of C2. The denominator is the probability of heads, heads, which of course is the same thing as the probability of heads, heads, given C2 times the probability of C2 plus the probability of heads, heads, given C1 times the probability of C1. So this is just a standard kind of Bayes rule question. Just a conditional probability. And now I put in the stuff. Uh, let's see, this one right here. Okay, what's the probability of uh, heads, heads, if I know that I have uh, a coin two, and the answer is, well, if I know it's coin two, then the probability of two heads in a row is three quarters squared. And what's the probability that I have coin two? Well, if I selected them at random, then each coin is equally likely to be selected, so the probability that I pick coin two is one half. And in the denominator, I'll write it like this because I don't have room here. The denominator, uh, notice that 
the first term in the denominator is the same as the numerator. And that's always true in a Bayes rule formulation that, that uh, when I express the denominator, the probability of the event on which I'm conditioning is the theorem of total probability. That's how Bayes rule was derived, that, uh, that there's a sum of terms in the denominator, and one of them is exactly the same as the term in the numerator. So the first term here is exactly the same thing. So it's going to be 3 quarters squared times 1 half. And the second term is then the probability of uh, heads heads if I'm tossing coin 1. And that probability is 1 half squared. The probability that I'm using coin 1 is 1 half. And then the rest is arithmetic. So by arithmetic, that turns out to be equal to 9 over 13, or 0 0.692308. Okay? So you can write the answer either this way or that way. Same thing here. Either that way or that way. Any questions about that? So this is this is supposed to be this is really simple, right? It should be simple after the fact. Once I explain it, it's obvious. I mean, this is exactly the stuff we've been doing in class. It may be hard to do it in the context of the test because you have to think fast and you're under pressure. But uh, there's nothing here that is not just what we did in, in the class. There's no point studying complicated problems. If you just do the ones that I did in class, then, and just go over and over that and try and understand it. Don't just do it one time, but look at it and say to yourself, make sure you understand each term. Ask yourself how you could change the question slightly, what effect that would have on the answer, why the answer turns out to be something it does. For example, in number three, uh, the question was, uh, suppose one of the coins is selected at random and tossed twice. If it produces two heads, find the probability in C2. Now, the fact that it produces two heads means that uh, it's more likely to be the coin that's biased towards the heads. Initially, the probability of picking the coin that was two heads was one half. But if I know that I got two heads, that means that I'm more likely to be using that coin. So the probability of coin two should be greater than one half. So I come over here and I look at the answer, and it's nine thirteenths. That's greater than a half. So that makes sense. Now, remember, you're calculating probability. So probabilities always lie between zero and one. So if you get a probability, and the answer turns out to be greater than one or negative, then you know that it's the wrong answer. Now, you may not know how to get the right answer, but what you should do is, for example, let's say that you got the answer and it turned out to be, well, let's say it turned out to be 5 thirteenths. 5 thirteenths, that's kind of subtle because you'd have to recognize that, well, that's less than a half, so it must be wrong. But still, it's not clear what the problem is. So if you said uh, the answer is 5 thirteenths, but it should be greater than a half, so I know the answer is wrong, then uh, you would get a lot more credit than if you just write 5 thirteenths. In fact, you could almost argue that somebody who got the wrong answer, but it was wrong in that way and knew it, actually knows more about the subject than somebody who just put in the, plugged in the formula and got the right answer. But if you wrote the 5 thirteenths and left it there, that's OK. I mean, it's wrong, but it's, it's not a big deal. You'd still get some credit, depending on how you got the 5 thirteenths. But suppose that the answer was minus 6. Suppose that's what you got. If you wrote minus 6 on your paper and you left it there with no comment, then my uh, uh, inference would be that you don't know that the answer couldn't possibly be minus 6. And so that's like the worst kind of mistake you can make. Anybody who takes this course and then calculates the probability and comes out with minus 6, you'd be better off if you uh, uh, never, never put the word FAU after your name. So, if, you, if the answer comes out to be something really stupid, like a negative number or a number greater than 1 for a probability, then you should either, don't just leave it blank. What you should do is you should say, 
uh, something like uh, the answer came out to be minus 6. I don't know where my mistake is, but I know that can't possibly be right. And then you would get a lot more credit than if you just wrote down the minus 6. Okay, so uh, communicate on these kinds of things. Okay, so that's question number three. Number four. If the coin that produced HH in the question above is tossed again, find the probability that it will produce another H. Okay, well, now the trials are not independent of each other because um, the, each trial, the more H's I get, the more likely it is that the coin I'm tossing is in fact the uh, biased coin. So if I toss the coin again, I should take into account that the probability that I have the biased coin is not one half as it was in uh, before, but it's now nine thirteenths. So the answer should be this: using the theorem of total probability, I would say, well, the probability that I am tossing coin number two, the biased coin, now is nine thirteenths. And if I'm tossing the biased coin, then the probability of another head is three quarters. On the other hand, the probability that I'm tossing the fair coin must be one minus nine thirteenths or four thirteenths. And if I'm tossing the fair coin, then the probability of a head is one half. So if you do the arithmetic on that, it will turn out to be equal to 25 over 32 or 0 0.673077. Oh, and notice that in solving this problem, I used P3 right here. And so uh, what you want to make sure is that if you got P3 wrong, you don't get P4 wrong also. So if I can identify, if it's clear to me the way you solve the problem, that the number that you put in here is exactly the number you got there, then uh, that's good, uh, even if the answer is wrong. If you had written it this way, for example, if you had said uh, P1, uh, not P1, P3 times 3 quarters plus 1 minus P3 times 1 half, and then whatever answer you got, even if that answer was wrong, if the P3 that you're referring to is this one, then this part would be correct even though this one is wrong. So make sure when you write your, uh, when you show your work that I can figure out what you did. Okay? Question there? Right. If you could say that again, if you could. If you say that it's, it's, it's going to be C2, why can't you say that it's going to be C2? Well, you don't know that it's C2. No, all you know is that the coin that you tossed, that you chose, gave you two heads in a row. So giving you two heads in a row, it's more likely to be the biased coin than it is to be the fair coin. Now, how much more likely? Well, that's what P3 tells you. In other words, instead of being having a probability of 50% of being a fair coin, it has a probability greater than 50%, 9 thirteenths. But it doesn't have to be the fair coin. If the probability of being the bias coin is 9 thirteenths, the probability of being the fair coin is 1 minus that. So this takes into account the fact that the first two heads give you information as to what coin you're tossing, which affects the probabilities, and that means that the probability of the third toss will also give you a head is this. Now notice that this number is greater than a half, but less than 0.75. If you knew that it was the biased coin, the probability of getting a head on the third toss would be 0.75. If you knew it was the fair coin, then the probability would be one half. Well, you don't know which one it is, but you know it's someplace between them. You know that it's, that it's more likely to be uh, the biased coin, so the probability should be greater than a half, but it's not certain that it's a biased coin, so the probability should be less than 0.75. So after the fact, again, this number makes perfect sense. Now, it's hard to ask for people to have that 
level of understanding during the exam. It's nice if you do, but if you do, of course, you wouldn't have any problem because you would get all the answers right anyhow. But when you're studying for this, you should look back on this and say, well, this makes sense. Everything in ultimately in this course should make sense. The only thing is that you don't understand what that is prior to taking the course because most people don't think this way until they're taught to think this way. You have to be, you have to have to be exposed to it formally. You just don't think of it on your own unless you're a pretty unusual person. Okay, so that was uh, uh, the first four. And the fifth one is actually simply one question with uh, uh, four different parts. Yeah. You have to, yeah, what, I guess what you're asking is, um, could I use Bayes' theorem to do this? The answer is, I think yes. What you're doing is you have to somehow or other take into account the information that a coin, which originally had probability one half of being fair and one half of being biased, now having produced two heads in a row, is more likely to be biased than it was before. So somehow or other you have to take that information into account so there's some kind of conditional probability in there. But there's not a unique way of solving these problems. So if you took a different viewpoint and you got the same numerical answer, then you're OK. But if you took a different viewpoint and you got a different answer, then you must have made a mistake or overlooked something. What I was saying, like, over there, you try to find out the, the outcome of two edges, but the point two, right? Right. And, uh, like, if you, if you apply this on question number four by doing the same point, point two, with three edges, we'll get some answer, right? And we add that answer with C1 with three edges, so it would be same, I guess. No, no, because uh, this is not the, the question here is, what's the probability that I get an H after I've already gotten two other H's? So you don't want to include the first two H's in the calculation, except to the extent that they affect what coin it is I'm using. So somehow, I have to break it down into saying, I got two H's, therefore, I know something about which coin I'm using. Now, I'm going to take that same coin, and I'm going to toss it again. So I don't want to calculate now the probability of three H's. I want to calculate the probability of one H, but that one H is coming from a coin that has probability 9 thirteenths of being biased and 4 thirteenths of being fair. Okay. So the interesting point here is that in this question of independence, if I know what coin I'm using, then the trials are independent because the outcome of the past should not affect the future, because we don't really know that. That's part of our model. But there's no other, other uh, unless you're a gambler that uh, knows that uh, God is with you and is going to make you win on the next toss, then uh, there's no way to make any as assumption about how the past is going to affect the future. So typically, if you you assume that it doesn't affect the future. Now, in this case, though, the past does affect the future in the sense that the past gives you information about which coin you're using. So if I tell you the coin I'm using, the tosses are independent. But if I don't tell you the coin I'm using, the tosses are dependent because the probability of getting a head or a tail on any toss changes with the past history. Because as the past history gives me more and more H's, I'm more and more likely to get a tail ahead on the next toss. And if it gives me uh, less and less H's, I'm more likely to be using the bias, to be using the fair coin, and then the probability goes back down to one half. Let's take an extreme case. I'll get to in a second. Suppose that there were two coins. Um, one of them had two H's. One of them was a double-headed coin, and one of them had an H and a T. So 
if I have the biased coin, the probability of a head is 1, and the probability of a tail is 0. Okay, now I'm going to toss these coins. If I toss the coins and I keep getting H's, the chances are that I'm using the two-headed coin. But you never can be sure there because I might just have gotten H every time, even though I could have gotten a T if I were using the fair coin. But as soon as I get a single T, then I know, if I get a T, that I must be using the fair coin because the bias coin could never produce two Ts. And from that point on, I know I have certainty that the coin then would be the fair coin and then after that, every toss would have a probability of one half of being head and one half of being tail. So you can always look at these extreme cases and it gives you a better understanding. Yeah? Example four shows that the probability of C2 and the three heads is actually less than the other three. Say that again. That probability there is 0.69. Right. And then to give you another head, you would think it would be higher than it's the biased coin, the probability of the four on the back side is 0.67. Now, this one says that, that it asks you what the probability is that the coin that you're using is the biased coin. Okay, now, originally the probability was one half, because you picked it at random, but now you have evidence that makes it more likely that it was the biased coin than the fair coin. So now the probability is 9 thirteenths, which is greater than a half, that in fact you have the biased coin. Now, the next question doesn't ask which coin you're using. It says you're going to toss the same coin again, and it asks for the probability that if you toss that same coin, you will get a head. So, you don't know which coin it is. If you're using the biased coin, then the probability is three quarters. If you're using the fair coin, then it's one half. Now, the probability that you're using the biased coin is 9 thirteenths, less than one. So, you don't know whether you're using the biased coin. So, you don't have certainty with respect to the biased coin. It's just more likely. So, since it's more likely that you're using the biased coin, but not certain that you're using the biased coin, the probability of a head should be somewhere in between the two. And that's what you get here. If you were using, if you knew you were using the biased coin, this answer would be 0.75. If you knew you were using the fair coin, it would be one half. The chances are a little bit better than 50% that you're using the biased coin. And so, therefore, this shifts the probability higher from 50% closer to 75%. But exactly how much closer, well, that's what we need the numbers for. So, this all makes sense, right? Okay. So, you can see that if you could, if you knew this, this exam would take five minutes. But remember, the important thing here is not the grade, it's something, but the reason for the exam is feedback. What you're supposed to do is, after the exam, you decide whether or not you want to drop the course. So, even if you did poorly on the exam, if when it's explained and you see it, you say, oh, yeah, of course, why didn't I think of that? How could I be so stupid, all that kind of thing? Then stay in the course. If your view is, I have no idea where this came from, these numbers are totally random, then you should drop the course. Okay. So, my, my, I have conflicting objectives here because from the point of view of the, of the profit to our shareholders, the best is if everybody drops the course because you've already paid and you get no refund. So, drop the course, I go home and we'll make the same amount of money. On the other hand, my personal objective is to have as many people stay in the course and learn as much as possible. So, I don't want to see anybody drop the course. So, take the exam as being something that is just feedback for your information. And even if you don't do well on it, if you understand what's going on, then, then stay in the course. Also, the, the, the character of the course is going to change because this is the, quote, easy stuff, unquote, because this is, doesn't use any mathematics. This is all high school algebra that we're using. And soon we're going to get into the calculus, use of calculus, the stuff that comes from homework zero. So, that will change the nature of the course somewhat. So, for some of you, it'll make it easier because it makes it more algorithmic. But for some of you, it'll make it harder because you don't know how to do the calculus. Okay, but everybody should know how to do the calculus. So, the course should actually be easier in the second one.
All right, here's uh, question number five. Agnes claims that she has ESP, extrasensory perception. That is, she can guess correctly the outcome of a coin toss more often than would uh, occur by chance. To test this, a parapsychologist tosses a coin a zillion times, and Agnes tries to guess uh, the outcome each time. Let P of XY be the fraction of trials for which the coin shows X, and Agnes guesses Y. For example, PHT is the probability that a coin toss produces H, and Agnes guesses T. Then it gives some data here, and then it asks for some probabilities and asks whether or not Agnes has ESP. So let's uh, set this up. Here's a matrix. So let's see. According to this, it says uh, X is for Agnes. So I'll let X go this way, and Y is for the guess. And uh, Agnes can guess uh, heads or tails. And uh, the coin can come out heads or tails. This is not a single toss. And according to the uh, um, statement. Let's see, the entries of this matrix would be the probability. So this would be the probability of HH. This would be the probability of TH and so forth. Okay, so according to the statement of the problem, the probability of uh, HH, which means that uh, uh, Agnes uh, guesses uh, a head and the coin is a head, that probability would be one half. Let me write it this way. This is the probability of HH, and that is equal to one half, one third. Read it right. okay. And the probability of TT that is the probability that Agnes guesses a T and the coin is a T. Under the coin is a T and Agnes guesses a T. We not to screw up here. Is one third. And the probability of HT, okay, now HT, that means that um, coin shows an H, so this would be HT. So the coin shows an H, and Agnes guesses a tail, is one sixth. And similarly, probability of uh, TH would also be more the same. Okay, so I have this right, let's see. Going down the, the um, a column here, this is the probability that um, okay, now H, let me get this straight. X is what the coin shows, so X. This is the coin going across the top. And Y is what Agnes guesses. So this is Agnes. And so this is the probability that the coin is ahead and Agnes guesses ahead. This is the probability that the coin is tail and Agnes guesses ahead, and so forth. OK, so now the first question is, find the probability the coin shows an H. The probability the coin shows an H is equal to the, um, this is the probability that the coin shows an H and Agnes guesses H, and the probability that the coin shows H and Agnes guesses tail. So if I add those two things up, which is one third plus one sixth, I get one half. So the sum of those two probabilities is the probability, that is, probability of the coin showing H and Agnes guessing H plus the probability of the coin showing H and Agnes guessing T. That's the probability that the coin shows H. That's one half. So the answer to P sub 5A is one half. So this is the probability that the coin shows H. Similarly, if I added these guys up, I would get the probability <laughs> the coin shows T. 
and that would also be one half, as it must be because that plus that have to add up to one. Likewise, if I summed across the row, I would have the probability that the coin shows H and Agnes guesses H, plus the probability the coin shows T and Agnes guesses H, that would be the probability that Agnes guesses H. So that would also be one half. So this is one half to a line like this. And this is one half. And these are called the marginal probabilities because this is the probability associated with Agnes. These are the probabilities associated with a coin, and they're obtained by adding up the probabilities, and you could write the answers in the margin. So that's why they're called the marginal probabilities. You're going to use that term, margin. But you don't have to draw this diagram because all you can say is this. I'll write it here. Piece of 5A. That's the probability that the coin shows H. That's the probability of HH plus the probability of TH. And so as we already saw, that's equal to uh, one-third plus one-sixth. HT? Yes. And that's equal to one half. Okay, so half the time the coin will show H. 5B. 5B, the question is, find the probability that Agnes guesses H. So Agnes guesses H, that would be the probability of H, H, plus the probability of T, H. And that will turn out to be one-third plus one-sixth, which is also one-third. So half the time the coin, the coin shows an H, half the time Agnes guesses an H. But the question is, what about the two of them? Does she guess the H, H? Does she guess the H properly more often than half the time? So question 5C is, what's the probability that Agnes guesses right? The probability she guesses right is the probability of H, H plus the probability of T, T. That's equal to one-third plus one-third, which is equal to two-thirds. So half the time, the coin shows H. Half the time, Agnes guesses H. But two-thirds of the time, Agnes guesses H correctly. So then 5D, the question is, this is not now a probability, the question is, does Agnes have ESP, uh, no credit without a short explanation? Well, does she have ESP? Well, if she didn't, then she would guess right half the time. But since she guesses right two-thirds of the time, then if she does that over zillions of times, then the intuitive argument is, well, then it's not just luck, because you might be lucky in uh, two or three tosses, but it's not going to be lucky zillions of times. So in other words, if the talk coin were tossed three million times, then she would guess right about two million times and guess wrong about one million times. So if she guesses right twice as often as she guesses wrong, then she must have ESP because there's no other explanation for that. So the answer is yes. Of course, she could have written lots of things that, would have, that might have uh, argued as to uh, why she did or did not have ESP because we never discussed exactly what ESP means. Um, but what I'm looking for is some kind of understanding here. The reason that the answer is yes is because the probability that she guesses right is greater than one half, which is what it would be if she had no idea what the coin was. So these kind of experiments have actually been done <coughs> for uh, several years, I think in the 70s or 80s, um, probably a result of the, of the uh, counterculture irrationality of the 60s. Uh, 
Duke University was running, uh, had this uh, fancy lab in which they ran these kind of parapsychology experiments. And it ran it for years and years. And uh, they were never able to get any answers that indicated anybody had any extrasensory perception abilities that uh, could be explained uh, other than chance. So they gave up on it. And that's the end of that until the next, uh, next fad comes along. But what's interesting here is that at first glance, it seems kind of strange because what we're saying is when comes out uh, head after time, Agnes guesses head half the time, but she guesses right two-thirds of the time, which means that her guess and the outcome of the coin are not independent. There's some dependency between them, and if there's some dependency, then it couldn't be random. She must know what's going on, so therefore you have to conclude that uh, either she has ESP or there's some other explanation, like someone is, is uh, feeding her information or there's a mirror or who knows what, something like that. But in other words, it wasn't by chance. Okay, so that was the exam. Uh, any questions about this? So how many people got most of it right? Okay. So that looks like nobody actually raised their hands. How many people got most of it wrong? Okay, so it's zero to zero. <laughs> All right, now your exam is going to be similar. People always say, what's going to be on the exam? And then so to reassure them, I always say something like, um, I'll use exactly the same questions. Only thing I'll change will be the answers. But nobody ever laughs because nobody seems to get it. So I shouldn't use that joke anymore. It answers this, questions the same, answers different. Okay, this one says, uh, consider a pair of identical-looking dice. And so it's a dice problem. So the, the principles are going to be exactly the same as in the coin problem, except that it's in the context of dice. So that's all I want to tell you at the moment. But otherwise, when you do it, and you'll see it's pretty much the same problem with the context change slightly. And of course, the question is not going to be exactly the same, but they're, they're similar. So just ask yourself how you could construct an exam based on uh, rolling dice in which the same principles are exhibited. Of course, they have to be the same principles, because those are the only principles there are in the course. That's all we've done so far in this course. The only uh, difference, I think, is that um, when we discussed the poker problem, the question, the difficulty was in the actual counting of the points in the sample space. and in this problem, it's easy to count. So the, the counting is not the, is not the difficulty. But otherwise, conditional probability, uh, Bayes rule, uh, independence, um, same stuff. That's all, that's all there really is. OK? Uh, let me hand out these homeworks, the ones that are left over. Lambro. Yakovos or Lenov? Okay, so we have about 23 minutes, and uh, first thing is, are there any questions about anything? I mean, this is this is just a review session. If not, then I'll start talking about what's going to come next. Part two of the first question. Suppose that C2 is tossed three times, find the probability it produces at least two heads. Okay. All right, so we know which coin we're using. We want to know the probability of producing at least two heads. So what you want to do is you want to look at the, uh, the possibilities here. You can get, what's the sample space? Um, three times, you can get H, 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 T, H, T, 
age, and so forth. How many points are there in that sample space? Well, there are two possibilities here, two possibilities here, two possibilities here. So there are two cubed or eight possibilities. So if you wrote them all out, you could simply look at all the cases that correspond to at least two heads. So what are they? But why don't I write them all out? Okay. So uh, there's three heads. Uh, here's two heads. T, H, H. And then uh, can we, is there another way we can get two heads? I don't think so. So then the rest are going to be things like uh, T, uh, T, H, T, H, T, um, H. We have H, T, T. And then T, T, T. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are the eight points. And you want to calculate the probability of having at least two heads. So that would be three heads or two, two, two. It's the only way I can get two heads. So I just add up those probabilities. So what's the probability of this one? Well, it would be one eighth because you would assume, you could assume that each point in the sample space has probability one eighth, or you could assume that the probability of any particular string is one half times one half times one half. So in any event, this probability is one eighth, this probability is one eighth, this probability is one eighth, this probability is one eighth. What's that? Oh, ah, okay, three quarters. Okay, so yeah, good point, because I, get, I confuse myself here. Because we're talking about the uh, coin C2. So if we're talking about C2, then although these are the possibilities, they are not equally likely. Okay, so now I have to go to the point, to the fact that the uh, probability of any string would be the product of the probability of individual pieces. And uh, uh, that would be because I would be assuming that the tosses are independent of each other. So this probability then, right here, probability of H, H, H would be 3 quarters times 3 quarters times 3 quarters, or 3 quarters cubed. Probability of H, H, T would be 3 quarters times 3 quarters times 1 quarter. So that would be 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter. Probability of HTH would be the probability of 3, would be 3 quarters times 1 quarter times 3 quarters, which of course is the same as the one above it, which is 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter. Probability of THH would be 1 quarter times 3 quarters times 3 quarters, or also 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter. So you see that these three all have the same probability. The only thing that differs is the uh, number of permutations. So the probability of at least two heads is the sum of these probabilities. So adding up these, the probability of exactly two heads would be 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter times 1, 2, 3. And then this term would be 3 quarters cubed. Now, the way I wrote it, because the way I think about this is to say, well, look at any particular string. What's the probability of a string that has two H's and one T? Well, it's going to be 3 quarters squared times 1 quarter to the 1. And how many strings are there like that? Well, it's a number of different ways I can uh, interleave the uh, two H's and the one T. So that would be three things taken two at a time. Three things taken two at a time is exactly the same as three. The other term would be uh, for any string that had three heads, that would be three quarters, 
to the 3 times 1 quarter to the 0. And they would multiply that by the number of different ways I could interleave the 3 H's, which of course is 3 things taken 3 at a time, or 1. So I get exactly the same thing. Now, the reason I wanted to do it this way is because, in general, I could ask this question. I could say, what's the probability that I have exactly k heads in such a string? So if the probability of a head on a single toss is p, and the probability of a tail is q, or 1 minus p, then any string that had exactly k heads and n minus k tails would be p to the k, q to the n minus k. So in our case, p is 3 quarters, q is 1 quarter, and k is going to be either 2 or 3. So I'm going to sum this over all k, from in our case, k equals 2, up to the upper limit, which is n, or 3. Okay, now, for any such string that consists of exactly k h's and n minus k t's, how many different interleavings are there? How many terms are there? And the answer is, well, it's a number of different ways I can interleave the, or choose, the k places out of the n. So this is the probability of exactly k h's. And then the question says, what's the probability of at least this number, at least 2 in our case, so I sum it from 2 on up. Now, if I have probabilities, these are, let's say this is p sub k, probability of k successes. Now I'm putting it in a more formal term, a formal model. Probability of k successes in n trials. Of course, these are n independent trials. So I have a sequence of n trials, and the probability of success on any trial is little p, and the probability of a failure on any trial, the tail, is little q, and I want to find the probability that in that string of n trials, exactly k of them are successes. Then this is a general model, and this would be the probability, and the set of probabilities that are of this form are called binomial probabilities. So shortly, when we start talking about probability mass function, you see that what we have is different models of discrete, well, not only discrete, but also continuous, which we'll see. We have different models, and some of these models are standard, and they tend to have names because they occur all the time. So this is one of the ones that's a standard model, because the setup is you've got this sequence of trials, and on every trial there are two possibilities, which we'll call success or failure. And in the coin context, we're calling a head a success and a tail a failure. And then the question is, I'm going to perform this experiment, run the sequence n times, and I want to count how many times the number of successes in the sequence of length n is exactly k. And the probability of that would be given by saying, well, if I write out a string, and you're independent, then a string that has k successes and n minus k failures must have a product in which there are going to be k p's and n minus k q's, and the total number of such terms is going to depend on how many different ways I can mix them up. The number of ways I can mix them up is n choose k. This is a standard kind of model. A series of successive independent identical trials, what's the probability that exactly k of them result in success and n minus k of them result in failure? That's called the binomial probability distribution. But from our point of view, you didn't have to know all of that. You were just supposed to simply write down and say, well, I'm going to toss this coin three times. What can happen? I can get that, 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 or that. 
And uh, what are the probabilities of those? Well, if they're independent, then this would be 3 quarters times 3 quarters times 3 quarters. This would be 3 quarters times 3 quarters times 1 quarter and so forth. So that means that this term, 3 quarters, is in there. 3 quarters cubed is in there once. And these terms, which are all the same numerically, are in there 3 times. So you didn't have to know this in order to write this down. Maybe that was the hardest question on the test. I don't know. Although I didn't intend it to be, because typically uh, the questions go from easy to hard. But I can't always tell what's easy and what's hard. A lot of it depends on how it's stated or what was discussed prior to the exam. You can't look at an exam and tell from the questions whether or not it's an easy exam or a hard exam. You have to know what the context of the whole uh, discussion is. You knew what you were doing. If this was the answer, if you wrote it like that and left that as the answer, this thing were worth five points, I'd probably give you four points for that. But I would prefer that you write this on the, on the scratch paper and then write the numerical answer on the, on the paper because, for one thing, everybody would, if it's right, everybody has the same numerical answer, so it's easy for me to grade. The second thing is that. This may be surprising, but I find that it's not unusual that people can write down an answer and they don't actually know how to make the calculation. Like people will write down um, some uh, combinatoric term, 25 things taken six at a time, and they have no idea what the number is or how to calculate it, but they know that it's 25 to 6. Of course, if you don't know how to calculate it, it's, it's worthless. So originally, when I first started teaching, I assumed that a person wrote a formula and they could get the number, the number was unimportant. But then I found out later that that wasn't always true. Especially with things that have exponentials in it. There'll be something like e to the minus 2.6. And there'll be people who write down their answers, even on homework problems where they had weeks to do it, they'll write e to the minus 2.6 because they don't know how to calculate e to the minus 2.6, even though all it takes is a single push of a button to calculate. So if you write the answer that way and leave it like that, then I wouldn't give you full credit. Oh, so you want a numerical answer? I want both. Okay. If you write, if it's a numerical answer and you get the right answer, then I know you must have done it, and so you get full credit. But if it's a numerical answer and you get the wrong answer, then unless you've written that, I don't know how you got the wrong answer. So what I'm saying is, on an exam, what you should do is, in the space where it asks you for the answer, write the number. But on your worksheet, write the formula and then equals the number. In fact, if you had room, the best thing would be, if this were the answer, and you had room in the answer sheet, to write e to the minus 2.6 equals, and then whatever it is. That would be the best. Okay, But the number, because there could be more than one way to calculate it, the number is right or wrong. That's, that's, the, that's how I can tell whether you have the correct answer. And then the formula tells me whether or not you made a mistake in arithmetic, which is not a big deal, or whether or not you didn't have the right form. Sort of common sense. I mean, just make believe that you are grading this thing. And you got a lot of them to grade, and you want to give appropriate partial credit. Anything else on this? Okay, we still have a few minutes. I hate to. Uh, How do you multiply m to c? Okay. How do you multiply? Can you multiply? Um, twenty-five to six. That's twenty-five factorial divided by six factorial. Uh, 19 factorial. Now, if I was doing this by hand, what I would do is I'd cancel out the 19 factorial to 25, and I'd do that. Did I make a mistake here? 
<laughs> oh, okay. So your question is why this is this? That factor plus that factor has to add up to that. Okay? So if I were doing it by hand, I would write 25 times 24 and so forth down to 20, uh, down to nine, uh, 20. And then that would cancel out the 19 factorial, and then I would have 6 factorial. 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And then there's lots of cancellation you can do with things like that. For example, 5 times 4 is 20, and 6 goes into 24, 4 times, and so on. So it's often very easy to do it. Now, you can also do it with a calculator, because with a calculator, you simply uh, get in uh, probably the third mode, and then you press the button that says uh, uh, NCR or something like that, and the, the number comes right out. So this is stuff that's, that's actually too easy to worry about. Everybody should be able to do this with a calculator or by hand. But as I say, I, I know from experience that if I gave a number like this and people, people left it in this form, there might be some people who actually didn't know how to calculate it, so that's why I would want you to actually calculate it. Okay? Okay, so we could just quit five minutes early. Students always like that. They're the only people who are happy when you give them less than what they paid for. <laughs> so sh should we quit? No more questions? Wait, there is a question? Question? Yes, open notes, open book, bring a calculator. You may not need it, but yeah, anything. Anything except a cell phone. <laughs>